Steel Metallurgy Steel is the widest used metal, but what constitutes a steel? How can we affect the properties? And what happens during the solidification of steel? These are a few key insights that we will try to uncover in this module. Steel is primarily iron with up to 1% carbon plus other alloying additions. In the majority of steels, this alloying addition generally totals less than 5%, but in some steels, this can be as great as 50%. A steel composition can be thought of as a recipe. Different amounts of each ingredient make up your final product. In steel, these ingredients are known as alloying additions. Each addition affects the properties of the steel in a different way. Depending on the amount and type of alloying additions added, we can affect the following properties in a different way. Strength – the ability to withstand load in tension. Hardness – the ability to resist plastic deformation, usually via penetration, also described as resistance to scratching or abrasion. Toughness – the ability to absorb energy. Ductility – the ability to deform without fracture. Fatigue, the weakening of metal caused by repeatedly applied load. Formability, the ease in which metal can be molded into the final product. Machinability, the ease in which metal can be processed into the final product with cutting tools. Weldability, the ease in which metal can be joined. Corrosion, the ability to withstand chemical reaction through oxidation. To affect the steel in this manner, a wide variety of elements can be added. These include carbon, silicon, manganese, phosphorus, sulfur, chromium, molybdenum, nickel, aluminium, niobium, also called columbium, titanium, vanadium, copper, boron, nitrogen, tungsten, Cobalt Carbon Carbon is the most important element for strength and hardness. As the level of carbon is increased, the tensile strength and hardness also increases. Carbon is a cheap way of increasing the strength and it is essential for the formation of microstructures. Phosphorus Phosphorus is usually classed as an impurity as it significantly reduces the toughness and ductility of a steel but it can be used as a solid solution strengthener. This is explained later in this module. Sulfur. Sulfur is usually classed as an impurity as it reduces the steel's ductility, toughness and weldability. Sulfur can form with iron to produce a low melting point impurity called iron sulfide. This can collect along grain boundaries and cause the steel to break up during hot working. This is called hot shortness. Sulfur is sometimes added to steel to aid machinability. Manganese Manganese has a great effect on hardenability and can be found in most commercial steels. Manganese can strengthen the steel through solid solution strengthening, which is explained later in this module. It also combines with sulfur to prevent hot shortness. Chromium Chromium increases the hardenability of steel. It can join together with carbon to form very stable carbides, which are excellent for wear and abrasion resistance. It is used in high levels in stainless steels for corrosion resistance. It does this by creating a protective oxide film on the surface of the stainless steel. Molybdenum Molybdenum also increases the hardenability of steels. When combined with chromium and nickel, it has a strong multiplicative effect on hardenability. It is both in alloy and stainless steels. Nickel. Nickel, as with chromium and molybdenum, increases the hardenability of steel and can increase the toughness of steels, particularly at low temperatures. Again, it is present in large amounts in stainless steels. Silicon. Silicon is mainly used to remove oxygen from steel in a process called deoxidation. The removal of oxygen in steel is important as oxygen can form voids in steel known as blowholes and porosity. Oxygen can also combine with other elements to form brittle particles known as oxides. Silicon can be used to increase the fluidity when casting steels. Aluminium. 
Aluminium is primarily used to deoxidize the steel. It can combine with nitrogen to form nitrides which can restrict grain growth. Niobium. Niobium, also called columbium, in small amounts can increase yield strength, tensile strength and toughness. Vanadium. Vanadium is used to increase the hardenability and toughness of steels through its ability to restrict grain growth. Boron. Boron can significantly increase the hardenability of steels and can enhance the effect of other alloying elements. Nitrogen. Nitrogen is often added in combination with other elements to form nitrides. These nitrides increase the hardness and tensile strength, but at the expense of toughness and ductility. When we add alloying elements, they do not always work in isolation. Sometimes the elements work in conjunction and can cause a multiplication effect that would not be expected from the sum of the individual additions. For example, both chromium and molybdenum may be added individually to a steel in order to strengthen it, but a small amount of molybdenum used in conjunction with chromium will result in a much greater strengthening effect than using one of the elements alone. The addition of carbon to iron is probably the most important addition in cast irons and steels. This makes a diagram called the iron-carbon equilibrium diagram very useful. Equilibrium means that enough time has been allowed on heating and cooling for any reactions to fully complete. Many of the basic features of this diagram influence the behaviour of the most complex steel alloys. The diagram is used to understand what structures will be formed at what temperatures and at what carbon contents. We can also see at what temperature different compositions melt and we can calculate how much liquid and solid will be present at a given temperature and can see when a steel will be fully solid. We can also calculate how much of each structure or phase will be present at a given temperature. On the diagram there are several points of interest. A1, the temperature at which austenite turns to perlite. Below this temperature, austenite, gamma iron, does not exist. This is 723 degrees Celsius. A3, the temperature when ferrite, alpha iron, transforms to austenite, gamma iron. For pure iron, this occurs at 910 degrees Celsius, but lowers in temperature along the line to 0.8% carbon then it increases in temperature up to 2% carbon. Liquidus temperature, the temperature at which steel of a given composition fully turns to a liquid. Below 723 degrees Celsius, we can see Fe3C, which is iron carbide. This is called cementite, which is a ceramic compound of iron and carbon. Steels with less than 0.8% carbon consist of a structure of ferrite and perlite, Perlite is a structure that consists of iron carbide, cementite, and ferrite, alpha iron, in parallel laths. Above 0.8% carbon, cementite and perlite are primary constituents. If we take an example of a 0.3% carbon steel, the steel is molten until we cool to 1510 degrees Celsius. At this point, the liquid iron starts to solidify into delta iron. From 1510 to 1495 degrees Celsius, the amount of delta iron increases while the amount of liquid decreases. At 1495 degrees Celsius, the body-centered cubic delta iron transforms to face-centered cubic austenite. As we continue to cool to 1,454 degrees Celsius, the amount of austenite increases and the liquid decreases until we have a fully solid austenitic structure. As we decrease in temperature further, the structure remains austenite until we hit 820 degrees Celsius, where it starts to form body-centered cubic ferrite. From 820 to 723 degrees Celsius, the amount of austenite decreases and the amount of ferrite increases, 
until the remainder of the austenite will transform. But as austenite has a higher solubility for carbon than ferrite, the ferrite that forms will not be able to accommodate all the carbon that was contained in the austenite, and thus, the remaining austenite will form a mixture of ferrite, alpha iron, and iron carbide, cementite. This structure is known as perlite. Here we can see some examples of different carbon contents and the structures produced. Low carbon. Structure consists primarily of ferrite with small grains of perlite. Medium carbon. Structure consists primarily of perlite with a small percentage of ferrite. High carbon. At 0.8% carbon, the structure consists perlite. Above 0.8% carbon, the structure consists of perlite and cementite. In addition to the iron-carbon equilibrium diagram, there are two other diagrams that are used extensively in metallurgy. These are the CCT, Continuous Cooling Transformation Diagram, and the TTT, Time Temperature Transformation Diagram. We briefly outlined these in this module and will go into these in a greater depth in a following module on heat treatment, where these are primarily used. While the iron carbon diagram describes the structures of steel under equilibrium conditions, where enough time has been allowed on heating and cooling for any reactions to fully complete, both the continuous cooling transformation and time temperature transformation diagrams allow determination of structures at various cooling rates from slow to very fast. Both these diagrams are helpful in selecting the optimum steel and process parameters to achieve a given set of properties. Continuous cooling transformation diagrams are generally more appropriate for engineering applications. The diagrams show the structures that are achievable continuously cooling from the austenitization temperature at a constant rate. These diagrams often show the structure that can be achieved at the center of different size bars for cooling in water, oil and air. Some diagrams also have the hardness that is achieved from this structure. Time temperature transformation diagrams show how long it would take for a structure to be achieved by holding at a given temperature. This diagram allows you to plot varying cooling rates and show the structure that would be achieved. Hardenability. In metallurgy, the hardenability of a steel is a key parameter and when we talk about hardenability in steels, we are often describing how deep into the steel we can achieve hardening. If a steel is described as having a low hardenability, this will mean that the steel will produce a shallower depth of hardness. When a steel has a high hardenability, it will be the same hardness throughout the thickness of the product. Highly hardenable steels are more important in large components. Hardenability is not to be mistaken for hardness. When describing the hardness, we are often looking at the microstructure achieved during cooling. For a given steel, it can be assumed that the quicker the cooling rate, the greater chance of achieving a harder structure. And if that steel has a high hardenability, this hard structure will be present deeper into the thickness. We can increase the hardenability of a steel by adding elements like manganese, molybdenum, chromium, nickel and boron. When we add these elements, it increases the hardenability and this will enable us to achieve a harder structure deeper into the thickness. The ability of the hardness to go deeper into the thickness is because it is easier to achieve a harder structure at a slower cooling rate. The structure of a steel can be perlite with ferrite or cementite which is the softest structure, martensite which is the harder structure and bainite which is in between. Looking at the continuous cooling transformation diagram, if a steel has a low hardenability, ferrite and perlite transformation will be shown in the upper left hand side of the diagram, meaning it will be difficult or even impossible to form martensite. If a steel has high hardenability, transformation to martensite will be shown at the bottom right hand side of the diagram, meaning that a steel will fully transform to martensite over a large range of thicknesses. Strengthening Mechanisms In the Introduction to Materials module, we talked about dislocations being present in metals. 
These dislocations reduce the strength of the metal. The principle of strengthening mechanisms is to reduce the ability of these dislocations to move through the metal. This can be achieved by the reduction in grain size, cold working, solid solution strengthening and dispersion or precipitation strengthening. These strengthening mechanisms can be applied individually or in combination. In metal, it is estimated that there are 10 million to 1 billion dislocations per centimetre squared and each dislocation has a strain field associated with it. With grain size, the grains can interact with the dislocations, preventing further movement of them. If we reduce the grain size, we can increase the number of grains interacting with the dislocations, preventing their movement and thus strengthening the metal. Cold work introduces a large amount of strain into the metal. This strain interacts with the dislocation's strain field, impeding the movement of the dislocations. Solid solution strengthening is applied when we add other chemical elements to a metal. As discussed in the Introduction of Materials module, the elements added can either fall between the atoms of the bulk material or replace the atoms. Within steel, carbon atoms fall between iron atoms and nickel atoms replace iron atoms. This will either be called interstitial or substitutional solid solution strengthening and will cause distortion in the atomic structure. This distortion interacts with the dislocations, preventing the dislocation movement and strengthening the steel. Dispersion or precipitation strengthening is highly related to the structure of the metal and takes place when a phase is finely precipitated through a softer matrix. This hard precipitate acts as a barrier to dislocation movement. The precipitates can also produce a strain field that interacts with the dislocation strain field. So, in summary, we have the ability to tailor the properties of a steel by adding different alloying elements. Alloying elements do not always work in isolation, sometimes they cause a multiplication effect. Carbon to iron is probably the most important addition to cast irons and steels. The iron-carbon equilibrium diagram, continuous cooling transformation diagram and time temperature transformation diagram are the most widely used diagrams in steel metallurgy. Continuous cooling transformation and time temperature transformation diagrams allow determination of structures at a variation of cooling rates. Hardenability describes how deep into the steel we can achieve hardening. Hardenability is not to be mistaken for hardness. When describing the hardness, we are often looking at the structure achieved from cooling. The structure of a steel can be perlite with ferrite or cementite, which is the softer structure, martensite, which is the harder structure, and bainite, which is in between. Dislocations reduce the strength of the metal. The principle of strengthening mechanisms is to reduce the ability of these dislocations to move through the steel. Strengthening can be achieved by the reduction in grain size, cold working, solid solution strengthening and dispersion or precipitation strengthening.